You gave us a garment of praise. It is the most royal and glorious robe that could be imagined. The most wonderful and glorious endowment of wisdom and splendor that could ever be given. The privilege, the ability to stand before the Master, the living God, to behold Him, to worship Him, to rejoice in Him, to be to just stand here today and rejoice for, over the fact that we've been delivered from the hand of our enemy, from the powers of darkness. We don't, we don't have to sin anymore. We're not carried about by diverse lust and iniquity. That's not the passion of our soul and our hearts, not into the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life. We've been delivered from the prison of it. I tell you, <laughs> it is a wonderful thing to have been rescued by the living God. <laughs> we have been, we've been so blessed. I, I'm first and foremost, I am so blessed uh, with the abiding place ministry. I, you know, the, the, the labor, the, the work, the faithfulness, the commitment of all of you, just, it, it's just such a blessing to me. Um, you know, I tell you, I know that people talk about the abiding place and the ministry all over the world because of your faithfulness and your giving and the fact that the God has taken a few people. Somebody said, how many people do you have in your church? I say, enough. <laughs> I have enough. I got enough to get what God's told us to do. Done. We had Brother Yun, the heavenly man, here last week and... And, um, you know, God blessed us. The Lord blessed us, blessed the offering. There was about $12,600 came in in a, in a Sunday morning. And we had over 200 visitors on top of the abiding place. And I said, uh, so tell me a little bit about the proportion of the giving. They said, well, I think the 200 visitors gave about $400. Come on, abiding place. <laughs> Somebody else may not get it, but you get it. And I'm telling you, in the name of Jesus, you're going to get more. Because those who have are going to, get, are going to, have, are going to have more. Father's promised it. And so, you know, once again, every one of you know what, what I expect. I expect you to go everywhere preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with signs, wonders, and miracles. With the demonstration of the power of the living God, Paul said, I have fully preached the gospel, and I am determined to raise up people who fully preach the gospel. We have gone from Jerusalem to Illyricum, and by mighty signs and wonders, and by the power of the Holy Ghost, <laughs> we have fully ministered this wonderful goodness that has been brought to us in Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Let me tell you who you are. You're a group of people that will not betray the king. You will not commit treason against the kingdom of God. But you'll walk faithfully before him all the days of your life. You'll serve him. The world go do whatever they're going to go and do. But you're going to walk everywhere Jesus Christ beckons us to come. Amen. 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 Say, I'm all in. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm all in him and he's all in me. Woo. Say, I'm all in him and he's all in me. Woo. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, God. Well, you can be seated for a minute. Once again, I, we're just so blessed to have Pat with us and the whole team. It's just been a blessing. It's been a blessing. And, uh, you know, I, I want us tonight, I want us to bless him. I want, I want us to bless him. I want us to bless the ministry. And I know that every one of you have been giving every night. And so you weren't supposed to hand out the buckets yet, but that's okay. That's okay. I might have you regroup and go get them again. No. I'm just 
I want every one of you to bless. I mean, I just want you to, somebody said, well, you know what? I've been giving, we've been giving, and I promise you this. Listen, let me promise you this, because you know this. Everybody that's been around me any time, you know this. When you begin to give beyond your ability, you begin to experience whole new dimensions of provision that you had not previously experienced. Because Father doesn't miss it, anything. Jesus describes the woman who gave the two mites as he hovered over the offering basket just solely for the purpose that you and I can be consciously aware that he is mindful of what we're doing. He is mindful of our giving. He's mindful of how our giving touches him. And you have to, I, I always love to remind people of this. Worship does not find its origin in singing. Worship finds its origin in the giving of the best offering that you have that represents the Redeemer that would come to deliver you and me out of the bondage of an eternal death, not a temporal death, not just a, a few bad problems and issues, an eternal death that was sealed against us. What an amazing God. What an amazing love. And the day, and I'm telling you, and I'm, I'm hastening into that day where I can fully comprehend that which God has grabbed a hold of me and apprehended me with. To comprehend the reality of what He's actually done for me. When He came and ransomed my soul with His own blood. <laughs> And I, I believe that the more we talk about it, I love to tell the story to those who know it best, seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. I love to tell the story of Jesus and His love. The old, old story of how He died for me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the precious blood. Thank you for the cal thank you for Calvary. Thank you for being willing to stay to hang there naked before man. And though you despise the shame, yet you rejoiced in your heart. Even going all the way to the place of saying, Eli, Eli, Lamax Abatani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because every bit of his life was nothing more than a fulfillment of the word as the manifest word. Amazing. As he stood between an eternal death and you and I right now. As he stood between eternal death and all humanity. And willingly offered himself a sacrifice. So that you and I could be delivered out of the hand of our enemy. And know nothing but the peace and the joy and the love of the living God, who now I know that everyone at least is somewhat aware of how the powers of darkness, how every force of hell does everything they can possibly do to shroud this wonderful love, to try to cause men not to be able to even begin to perceive all that God has done for us. But I'm telling you, as you lay hold upon Him, the beauty and the splendor of His love grows more real and meaningful and a reality every day. A greater reality of what He's done for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord Jesus. Just would you tell Him, just that simple, those simple words with me for just a little while. Just say, I love you, Lord Jesus. Just tell Him. You can whisper it. You can scream it. You can just, I love you, Jesus. Because it fills it fills the halls of heaven. It fill it fills the holies of holies where Father is seated right now, with a cloud of smoke called the incense of the prayers of the saints. I love you, Lord Jesus. I love you. I love you. Just tell him. Just tell him a little. Well, this is a great song right here. I love you, Jesus. I love you. I love you, Jesus. You can go ahead and pass out the offering baskets. I think half of them went over that way. And it's okay. If you, if you decided you wanted to give more, you can catch up with that offering basket.
If someone would have asked the Lord how much you're going to give, he's, he would say, I'm going to give it all. And when you sow it all, when you sow it all, Father raises it up in glory. When you sow it all, Father raises it up in glory. When you sow it all, Father supernaturally works by His Spirit as hard as it is maybe to comprehend. He raises it up in glory just like Jesus came up from the grave. Father, I thank you for blessing this offering tonight. I thank you for the multiplication of the finances that were given by those, O oh Lord, the giver. Father, I thank you that it's a multiplication that meets every need of the ministry. And, you know, I, I'm always a little delayed on, on, on saying certain things that I probably should say up front before people give. But all of the finances, we're just sowing in to I Am Remnant Ministry. And really, this is about taking the message of salvation, the move of God, the call of heaven, the call of the Spirit to the churches of the United States of America in a very needy time. Because all the things that have happened in the past, I was just talking with dear pastor, I was, just, I was saying, you know, all the things that have happened in the past where God and His grace and His love has raised up people with wonderful anointings and then they ultimately did wrong things that brought shame to the name. And I can tell you there's one thing that Father doesn't take lightly, and that is bringing shame to the name. Father's doing something now, a new work, where people will not betray Him. He will raise up a people who will not commit treason against the kingdom of God, who will stand faithfully even unto death. Yes. Hallelujah. That's who we are. Yes. That's who we are. Yes. That's who we are. Yes. We're not going to bring shame to the name, for we're giving our lives to to glorify the name. To say, be glorified in me, Jesus. Be highly exalted in me, Jesus. Be magnified in me, Jesus. Lord, you were made a sin offering for me. You gave it all to be the sin offering for me. Oh, Lord, I gladly give all in return to be your righteousness for you. To be the righteousness of God. He who knew no sin became the sin offering. The Hadad, he became a sin offering that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amazing, amazing love. Lord, we thank you, Holy Spirit, for filling us with that kind of love so that we can first love you with the same love you've loved us with, that we can love you with an uninhibited, unmixed, genuine love with the purest of motives. That in turn we can also begin to love everybody of the household of faith. Even unto the place of loving the lost and dying world like you did, Father. When you gave your only begotten Son. Father, we thank you for the capacity to, to do that which we're, goes far beyond the human ability. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, for your amazing love, your amazing grace. Hallelujah. Well, Patrick, Pat. The Bible says in Isaiah 10, verse 21, a remnant will return. A remnant of Jacob will return to the mighty God. I want you to know that um, how many of you got touched by Jesus this morning? Wasn't that, wasn't that fun? Wasn't that powerful, powerful time? And, and uh, you know, I want I to say a couple things before we get, uh, I introduce and, and let uh, uh, just the, 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 the lion roar for a few minutes. But I believe that God has inhabited this weekend how many of you believe that? Give the Lord a praise. Amen. 
And I've had different, different people come up to me and say, you know, I've just been shifted in my spirit. And I, I want to say something. You are some of the kindest. I'm reminded of Paul when he's talking to Thessalonians and, and just greeting them. And every time Paul wrote a letter, he greeted. We wrote, I wrote the Remnant book as a letter because it's time to be his letter to the world. Are you with me? And uh, if I were to write a letter about Abiding Place in San Diego, what I would say, I, I greet you in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, risen from the dead. And then it would say very simply, you truly are some of the purest, most humble, passionate, hungry people I've ever met in my life. And you carry, folks, I've traveled all over, all over the world. I preached every Sunday in a different place just about for uh, many, many years. And, and to come here, and, and you have taught me. I, I, I was talking to, to, to Stevie in the back back there because we're launching this vision around America. And, and, uh, and I said, you know, the, I think the first two remnants have not have been about those places, they've been about us, growing in covenant, growing in depth with God. And I've learned more this weekend. I told Karen, my beautiful wife, and she brings you greetings. She cannot wait to, to come and, and meet you all. But I said, this weekend, God has shifted me in my spirit. I went to bed praying in the spirit, woke up praying in tongues. Now, that's called an impactful church, amen? Because there's, there's, there's other churches I've gone to bed not praying in tongues, but saying other stuff. And so, but... That was, that was stupid, wasn't it? And, but I honor you. I honor those that have worked so hard from the setting up the lights, the stage, the worship, uh, the entire team, the worship band. You know, I travel a lot of places, and, and worship is big in America right now. And I think we're honestly raising a saw generation that likes worship more than word because it soothes their demons. And, but God is raising up pure worshipers again. That it's not about look at me, look at me, but look at him. And that's what we've seen on this stage this last week. And we've seen people that are just desperate. They didn't give a rip. If you were singing or not, they were praising the king. That's what worship is. And we've seen that. Let's give it up for the worship team. Isn't that unbelievable? Josh came all the way up. And the, the entire team has just been so pure. And, and to watch them get up there and say, let's just do this thing. Because uh, at a lot of conferences around America, it's about who's singing and not about who they're singing to. And it's the celebrity stuff. And, and I, I just, I've been refreshed. I feel like I've been in a shower all weekend of God's love. And I want to say to those that, that, that set up chairs and food and all the stuff. In fact, if you've served, and that may be the majority here, um, which is really refreshing, would you just stand up? We want to give it up to you. We want to just say thank you because look at this. Yeah. The, the, go ahead. The whole church stand up. That's it. Because come on, let's give it up. Give it up for yourself because it's. And with this kind of a servant heart, God's just preparing you for what's to come, the bigger. But this is remnant this weekend, and I want to say we honor you. We love you. Pastor Steve, come here and greet everybody if you would. Pastor Steve ministered last night, and he is a, uh, a, a covenant brother. But more than that, he's a man that carries the mantle of, of the remnant. I just want him to greet you because he spoke this morning at, a, at another house. And then, and then, but I wanted to take a moment to greet you. Would you make him welcome? I greet you. I was going to say Nanu Nanu or something like that. But, uh, <laughs> you know what, guys? I I'm going to tell you something. I have, uh, you know, when Pat and, and my son said, hey, let's do this. And I, I never, I, I just didn't know what to expect. And, and can I say something? I have truly enjoyed being here. I have truly enjoyed getting to know your pastors. And I, I always give honor to whom honors do. I'm going to tell you something, guys. I, I have met a lot of people, and, and, and I don't say this because I have to. I say this because I believe it. Your, your pastors are really kind-hearted people that love God, and, and they, yeah, you ought to thank God for them. Let's just thank God for them for a moment because, really, they're, they're awesome. Yeah, we should stand. That's so awesome. That's so awesome. That's so cool. And and you know what? They love the word. They love righteousness. But you know what? They love you guys. And I know pastors that 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 pastor churches and they hate the people. Seriously, I, I met them and I'm like, 
You know, but you can't lead anybody you don't believe in. And it's wonderful to be around men and women of God that believe in the people that they called to serve. Because really, as ministers, we're called to serve. And, and they serve, and in turn, you serve. And what you've done this weekend, I mean, to, to change your, your life for a few days, to come out each day and each night, is absolutely incredible. And I'll be forever thankful. I, I, I believe that God is building relationships here uh, that we knew not of, but He knows. Because I believe this, if you acknowledge God in all your ways, He'll lead and direct your steps. You just don't know where He's going to direct them to. And, and there's key relationships and people that God wants you to meet, not just so you can have a relationship, make it better. And your pastors are smart, smart people. His kids are smart. I say kids are young adults, right? They're adults. Smart people. I so honor them. Um, and, I, and I told them this, that uh, for what, um, for, for the, I, I watch their children, and I'm so blessed because I know what it's like, the pressures of the ministry. And they love God. They're willing to help anybody. They're willing to help other ministers that need help. And guys, you really have something special here. And here's what I know about ministers that really serve. They can't toot their own horn. They don't get to blow their own trumpet. So people who honor and esteem can come and say, thank you for what you do. Thank you for this great church. And thank you for allowing us to come, uh, Pat and myself and my son and his team, to be able to come and serve you for a a uh, time and 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 our hope and prayer is that when you leave this place tonight and this weekend's over you'll never stop thinking about i am a part of something bigger than myself i'm part of the remnant that says i believe in truth i believe in righteousness i believe that godliness is still a virtue that we should embrace i believe that god's ways are the right ways you know there's a, there's a way that seems right unto a man but the end thereof is death but God's ways are so much higher than our ways. And thank you, thank you, thank you for having us. Thank you for being here and through the day and at night. Thank you, pastors, for allowing us to come. And thank you for allowing me to meet you. I'm so blessed. And I mean that. And so thank you, guys. May God bless you. Well, it's time for the word. Anybody ready for the word? Anybody hungry for the word? The Bible says in Romans 11, verse 5, so, so too at the present time there's a remnant chosen by grace. And I believe that one of the voices that God is raising up to help transform this nation, a general, and I call him a lion because he roars and he carries that mantle. And he, he is someone that walks in purity, but he's an amazing dad, an amazing husband, more than all the ministry stuff. And we've kind of joined forces and we're just like, let's go do this. Let's be crazy. Let's lay it all on the line. And... Uh, when you get ministered to, I was going to share tonight, and man, when I got done this morning, the Lord said, you're done. I always know when he's done. You know, the apostles lived on, on uh, uh, go until God would put a red light up, and I felt like this morning, when I got on my knees, I, I, I was up there, and I just dropped my knees, and the Lord said, okay, you're done. And so the, the Holy Spirit spoke to me that he is to preach tonight, that Stevie's supposed to preach. So would you give it up, because he's going to bring the word. Come on, Pastor Stevie. Well, thank you again for having us here. I need to brag on your church just a little more before I really get into the Word. Um, there was a sweet lady pastor in your church uh, that yesterday, I believe Rosemary, is that, am I, am I getting your name? Where is she here? She doesn't want to be acknowledged, but there she is, I see her. Um, yesterday, I don't know if you knew this pastor or not, but I'm going to brag for a second. I'm going to kind of give her a testimony of what she did and what it meant to me. She came up to me with a, a little Macy's box uh, that had a, a necklace and some earrings in it. And she said, you know, the Spirit of the Lord was speaking to me and told me to get this for your wife. And, and, and you know, that's not really happened to me ever through the different places I've been or whatnot. Um, and she hands it to me. She says, the Spirit of the Lord told me to give this to you. Well, what's interesting is shortly before that, I was talking to her on the phone. This was last night before the service. We're over there. And she was just, she was kind of getting a little teary because she missed me so much. And um, this is a new season for us with me traveling. And she's not used to that. And so this is kind of stretching us and how we're doing things. And so she, she had been kind of a little teary-eyed about, you know, I'm gone. And we, she was trying to potty train our two-year-old son, which... I feel bad for her because if I was there, it wouldn't have happened. I'd have been like, just put the diaper on him. He's my kid. He's going to do it when he's ready. Uh, we're, we're a little strong-willed and stubborn at times. But uh, So she was a little teary-eyed. So this morning, 
And when I had called her late last night, I had woken her up, so I just prayed with her and prayed over my son and our, our daughter that's uh, in the womb right now. Uh, because obviously when you're in the womb, you're already alive. You're not in, okay, whatever. Uh, that's a different note, right? Uh, that is murder when you take that life. But I called her this morning and I said, hey, I want to tell you something that happened. I was going to wait till I got back, but she was having a tough morning with Trey, and she woke up. She's had uh, an incredibly terrible pregnancy in terms of pain, and uh, my mom actually had to go to our house and take her crutches today because she's struggling to walk, and so she was on the phone, and she just sounded really sad, and so I started, I told her, I said, hey, I need to tell you something, and I said, this, this sweet lady at the church really listened to the Spirit of God, and let me tell you what they did. They, they gave me this Macy's box, and in it was a, a necklace and some earrings for you. And what she told me to tell you was that this was so that you know that the people of God appreciate the sacrifice that you're making by allowing me to be here and be a part of the remnant movement. And, and Rosemary, can I, that's your name, correct? I'm getting this right. Okay. She started crying to where she couldn't even speak on the phone. And I, I'm not a crier and I'm getting emotional right now, but she started crying because she was so touched by you listening to the Spirit of God. And, you know, this church has been, you, you've been a tremendous blessing to me and to my family as I, I embark on this endeavor with Pat and we go around the nation screaming remnant. And, you know, I'm used to my home where we've got all these people and all this stuff going in the youth ministry that I've been leading for seven years now and all the different things. And this is stretching me because it's different. It's different being away from my family. But she started crying and she was so taken back and blessed by that because no one's done that for her. I mean, people have told me, oh, you're a great preacher, you're this and you're that, whatever. But nobody's really ever taken a, a moment when I've been out gone to do something like that. And so thank you so much for what you just did for my family. And thank you for listening to God. And man, she was crying. It, it broke me. And I don't, I don't cry. I'm it's just not me. I, I, I get emotional sometimes. The, the, one, the first time I really cried in my life actually was when I got called into ministry. I remember uh, I, was, I was in Colorado Springs. I was about to be a senior in college, and I was a finance major, finance and entrepreneurial studies. So I was interning with a finance company up in Colorado Springs, which is about five hours north of Albuquerque. And I'm there, and I got hooked up with the church there, New Life Church, um, and they had this group of, of young people that were super on fire for Jesus, and so I, I started hanging around with them, and I really got a passion for God at this point in time. I didn't want to be a preacher. That was what my dad did. That wasn't my thing. Um, he really didn't even want me to be in the ministry because of how difficult it can be, and he said, Stevie, just, just go make a lot of money, okay? And I was cool with that because I was like, cool, then I could pay for all the churches. Like, this is going to be great, and so I, I had this plan, and I watched a movie. I watched uh, the second Batman movie, the one with the Joker, uh, the really creepy Joker, if you've seen the movie. Why so serious? Like, creepy. And I, I left the movie theater, and, and I'm driving on the interstate, and this had never happened to me, and I couldn't drive anymore. I just started crying. I pulled over to the side of the road, and all I could think about was that Heath Ledger had overdosed and died. And God broke my heart in that moment for the lost. I had seen people saved and lives changed. But in that moment, I remember sitting on the side of the road for near an hour crying. And I don't cry, so this was weird for me. And I'm just sitting there crying because all I could think about was, man, he was so great in that movie, but he, he died and I don't know that he's in heaven. Now, I don't know that. Maybe at his last dying breath, he cried out to God like the thief on the cross. I don't know, but all I know is in that moment, God really broke my heart. And from that day forward, I have become addicted to seeing people get saved. I have become addicted to it. And so when I say I'm not a crier, I tell you that to say, you got me. You listening to the Spirit of God got me. And pastor, that's the people you have. I, I just love you. I love your family. I love your church. I love what you guys have been doing. You guys have been... A, more than a blessing to my family. I can't even describe what you've been to my family in this time and the encouragement that you were to my wife um, to let her keep going. So thank you guys so much. So Sorry I had to brag for just a second more on your church, but you guys are phenomenal. So tonight I have a message called Raising the Bar and I'm, I'm kind of a person that I don't really like church sayings. It's just me. Uh, I've been in church world all my life, so, you know, people have different church sayings. And what I found out as I got older and really started studying the Bible, that a lot of the sayings that people were saying to me weren't biblical. 
Like they sounded really good, right? It was Christianese, and it sounded awesome. It came out of their mouth, and it was like, man, that was encouraging. And then I look it up, and I'm like, wait, that's not even Bible, right? And so I would look it up, and so whenever I hear a cool term, and I'm like, man, I want to preach on that, I'm like, I got to make sure it's Bible first, right? Like, that's just my personality. I don't want to just preach a cool saying if there's nothing in the Bible to back it up. So I like to look things up. So this message tonight is called Raising the Bar. And I'm going to show you in the Bible that raising the bar and living a life that raises the bar. Because that's who the remnant is. The remnant raises the bar. Right? We've had all these encounters with God this weekend. And God is, we've sp- spoken about truth. But here's what the remnant does. We have an encounter. We, we experience and learn the truth. And then every day we raise the bar. That's who we're called to be. So I, I thought about that, and I said, okay, is it biblical? So I looked this up, and God brought me, and I came across this in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. This is the Apostle Paul. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. So when I read that, I saw, hey, that's somebody who's he's talking about it. I haven't got there yet, so I've got to raise the bar. I've got to get to that perfection. I've got to keep going, and I've got to keep striving, and I've got to keep working toward the perfection for which Christ called me. I, I saw what raising the bar was in the writings and what Paul said right there, that I, I haven't achieved these things yet. I haven't arrived yet. You know, sometimes what I've found with church people is we feel like we got saved and we arrived. Like we've done something. I made it. I, listen, I'm not making it until I'm for sure that God's going to look at me till I've died and he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's the only moment I'm going to realize I made it. This, this dude made it. Can you believe it? I can't, but thank you, God, I made it. But listen, we've got to be a people like Paul that raised the bar. You know, when I think of raising the bar, you think of the Olympics or track and field, right? You've got the pole vault and the high jump in them. Entire purpose is right to raise the bar higher than the person before you. And I guess it's because I grew up in a competitive family and in a competitive environment. I don't care what we're doing. I want to beat you. It's weird. Like, I'm not the guy that's like, you know, when I play with my son, it's like, you know, maybe you can let him win. No, no, no. He's got to learn to lose. I really believe you've got to learn to lose. My father did this to me. Uh, when Growing up, we'd play basketball, and he'd beat me all the time. And he, he told me this one day. He said, son, if I ever, we get to the point where I feel like you can beat me, we'll never play against each other again. That happened. There was a point where I, I really believed, man, I could get him, and we never played again. Never, I've never actually beat him at one-on-one because he stopped playing me. It's not fair. I want to play. Uh, but he told me that, and so we're just a competitive family. So when I think about raising the bar, I get competitive with it. I get competitive with my everyday life because that's who the remnant has to be. We have to stay in a constant state of competitive attitude. Why? Because the devil is competitive. He's trying to take people to hell. And if I'm not going to rise up and be the remnant and tell people the truth in love and lead them to the cross, I'm okay with them going to hell. We can't be okay and comfortable with people dying and going to hell. We have to get a little bit uncomfortable and say, man, I want you to go to heaven. And here's the real harsh reality of that, that not everybody's going to go. See, the truth is, the remnant truth is that Jesus himself said the road is narrow. Only a few find it. The path to destruction is broad and wide. So we've got to be the ones who find those that are supposed to be on the narrow path. Our job as the remnant is to drag those with us, to pull them with us, to build relationships with them, get to know them every day, use the gifts that God has given us to see somebody's life changed for eternity. God broke my heart on the side of the road on Interstate 25 in Colorado Springs for the lost, to see somebody's life changed. But that doesn't mean I shy away from the Bible. It means I use the Bible. I'm not, the remnant doesn't cover up the cross. We show the cross. There's a movement in church world to cover up the cross so that, oh, maybe then the lost people will show up. Listen, we're supposed to be reaching people on the street. 
Paul said, I didn't come with eloquent speech, but with signs and wonders. We're supposed to be reaching people every day. Life. Church is an expression of that. We get to, then all these people we've gotten saved just by hanging out, out with them, get to come worship with us, and we get to spend some time in God's presence, and He gets to pour it out on us, and we get to leave and be even more fueled up and more fired up to reach just one more. But we can't do that if we don't raise the bar. If we're content with where we're at, the remnant is never content. The remnant is never satisfied. Why? Because we always want more of Jesus. We always say, I have not reached that perfection yet for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. But what do I do? I forget the past and press on. I run the race with endurance so that one day we can look back at our lives and be just like Paul and say, I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. I'm ready to go home. I've done what I can. See, because I don't believe we ever retire from the work of Jesus. We don't ever retire from that. I know in American culture, it's like we do this and then we're supposed to retire. How do you retire from reaching people for the cause of Christ? You don't retire from that. You might retire from your day job, but that just means now you get all that free time to tell somebody about Jesus. Oh, but I've worked so hard, it's time for me to relax. Why relax? They're dying and going to hell. I can't relax. I can't sleep. The remnant doesn't, the remnant loses sleep. Because the remnant knows I've got somebody else to reach. I've got somebody else to talk to. I've got to raise the bar. I've got to pray a little more today than I did yesterday. I've got to worship a little more than I did. I've got to get in the Word. I've got to read a little more. I've got to study a little more. I've got to do something different today that I didn't do yesterday. Because if I just do what I did yesterday, I'm missing it. I'm losing. So it made these, some of these guys, Larry Bird, Michael Jordan, so great. They worked when nobody else wanted to. They worked harder. They practiced longer. As people of God, we've got to work harder and practice longer. Heaven's all going to be about worship. Why don't we practice more? I don't want to stick it to heaven and be surprised. Whoa, we, they worship here. What? They, they're, they're worshiping God? Yes. Yes. That's what heaven is. See, I think even sometimes we've sometimes thought that heaven is somehow about us. Because it sounds like it's about us, but it's about God's glory. I want to go to heaven so that I can do all these cool things and da-da-da-da-da. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. I'm going to heaven because I want to be around God. I want to be around Jesus. I want to be able to look upon him and not go blind. I want to be in my perfected state. I want to not have to have any more tears and cry anymore where I could just worship God for all of eternity. The remnant longs for that day. The Apostle Paul actually talks about that, that there's a crown awaiting those who daily long for His coming, who daily wait upon the Lord to come. Listen, I want Jesus to return when I'm doing something for Him. I don't want Him to catch me napping. I want Jesus to return while I'm leading somebody to heaven and we both take off with Him. I don't want to be in a conversation with somebody and Jesus show up and I leave and they're there. Let's just both go. Why? Because I have to tell you because I, I, I have to raise the bar. And as we raise the bar, it's not even just about other people. It's about you and I. It's about being full of the Spirit. You know, we receive the Holy Spirit when we get saved, but it's just a little bit. We've got to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and not just once, but every day. I ask God every day, fill me fresh. Give me something new. Teach me something new. Speak to me in a different way so that I can learn all the ways that you talk to me. Show me something new about you, God, so that I can use that to help somebody else so that I can show them Jesus. You know, I think sometimes we, we go to reach people, though, and our motivation is conversion. It's got to be love. Because when it's love, they'll, they'll see the power of God and they'll come to conversion on their own because God will deal with their heart. The Holy Spirit will convict them. I don't save anybody. The Holy Spirit does that. It's my job to show them Jesus, their job to respond to it. So you know what? When I tell people about Jesus, different things, I don't lose sleep because they don't accept him because I know my job is just to plant the seed, just to live the life in front of them. I say this all the time and I love it. The way you live your life may be the only Bible that somebody ever reads. 
Somebody may never open a Bible, but they're going to watch how you live. And if we look just like them, if we're drinking just like them, if we're watching some of the same things they're watching, listening to the same stuff they're listening to, we complain just like they do. There's nothing about us that's special. We've got to be a people that are in the world, but not of the world. The remnant is not defined by culture. We tell culture who Jesus is. We transform culture. When the remnant shows up, hell shakes. When the remnant wakes up, the devil gets nervous. Because he knows they're going to raise the bar today. They're not going to be okay with the status quo. They're not even going to be okay with the miracle I performed yesterday. They want another one. They're not okay with just this. You know, and I look at the Apostle Paul, and we need to be like him because the Apostle Paul, man, once he got a hold of Jesus, that guy went crazy. But you know what? Because sometimes we can get in a religious spirit and we can look at lost people and say God can never use them. Paul hated you and I. Paul hated the people of the way. He was putting them in prison. Paul, his name was Saul, and he was one of the top Pharisees. And as a top Pharisee, all he really had to do was write laws to put them in prison, persecute them, kill them, whatever. Paul didn't actually have to do all those things. But you know what? I, I, God saw something in Saul or Paul that a lot of times we'll miss. He saw somebody who not only would write the law, but would perform the law. God saw somebody who would get his hands dirty and do what he said he was going to do. See, a lot of times we feel good when we talk about something. Last time I checked, we ain't supposed to feel good till we did something. Too many of us, we feel good talking about it. We feel good telling everybody about our dream. Listen, can I, can I help all of us? When God gives you a dream, just shut up. Okay, what do you mean? Just shut up. Show people the dream by what you do. Show them by your work ethic. I don't need you to believe in my dream. God has given me a dream. I'm just going to do everything I can to make that dream that God gave me become a reality. Because when you tell somebody, you end up in situations like Joseph. I just don't want to, you know what? God gave me the word so I can learn from their mistakes. I know some of us are a little more hard-headed. We're like, but I want to learn on my own. Well, good luck. God gave us his word and showed us all these characters and all these different people that live life. And what he was showing us is, here, don't make these mistakes. I can still use you when you make them. That's what's great about them, but don't make the same mistakes. So as we get in the word and as we raise the bar, we begin to see. And what we see in the life of Paul is a different mentality. We see a mentality that's hungry to just every day, God, I want something different. And that's why God used him to write two-thirds of the New Testament, because he saw somebody who would do what he said he was going to do. He didn't commit to something and cancel. He didn't make up excuses. He said, you know what, I hate the Christians. I'm going to go put them in jail myself. He said, wow. Yeah, God used that guy to write two-thirds of his word. That his writings impact how we do church. How we gather together, how we worship, how we pray, all of these things. God used this man. Why? Because he was a man who would do what he said he was going to do. The remnant is a man or a woman of his word. That when you say it, let your yes be yes and your no be no. People tell me all the time, do you promise? I'm like, I'm not promising you. Why? Because the Bible told me, let your yea be yea and your no be no. If I tell you I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. If I don't tell you I'm going to do something, I'm not going to do it. See, some of us need to learn to say no sometimes. Some people, and I don't know, this, this is a random thought. This is for somebody. You overpromise. Because you don't want anybody to think negatively of you. Because you don't want your reputation ruined. Oh, but they're so reliable and you hold on to that reputation. Can I tell you something? A reputation is really just a shadow. Character is who you really are. And if you can't do it, just say, I can't. Be honest. Don't, don't overpromise. Don't overextend yourself. Because listen, reputations are fleeting. It's just a shadow, and that shadow changes based off of what light you put on it. As a pastor's kid growing up, there was a time in my life that I wanted the shadow of he's a good kid. So I would tell you all the right things and do all the right things in church so that you said he's a good kid. But there was a rebellious spirit inside of me. I said, I want to test the waters. 
But I had this reputation, and what I did was I guarded that reputation, and it became about guarding a reputation instead of working on the character of who I was and raising the bar every day to be more like Jesus. We've got to throw reputation out the window and be people of character. Because listen, when you stand for truth as the remnant, your reputation with the world, you might be hated. Embrace that. Say, I'd rather be loved by heaven. I'd rather be like Stephen, where he looks up and Jesus is standing in his honor. Stephen saw Jesus standing because Jesus was honoring him. That's what angered them so much, was that they thought, who does he think he is saying Jesus is standing in his honor? When, when I think about my life, I want God to look and stand. I want to make God proud. I want those moments where God looks at me and says, that's my little boy. That's my little boy right there. I'm proud of you, son. Way to go. I want to see someone saved and God look at me and say, good job. I don't need you to tell me good job. I need God to tell me good job. Because, listen, anybody can speak. We all have mouths. But we can't. Sometimes we can't get to the concept of always making sure God is proud of us. It's not a popularity contest. Listen, I want to be popular in heaven. I want to be the guy in heaven that people want to talk to. Like how I want to go talk to Adam and say, dude, why did you eat it? But not that way. I want to be like, I want to be like David. Because I want to talk to David and be like, how did you have the courage to slay Goliath? I want to be that guy. That l- generations from now, they look and say, man, I want to talk to him in heaven because he gave his life for the cross. But you can't do that unless you raise the bar. We cannot do that unless every day we wake up and raise the bar. And see, Paul had a different mentality, and you can see it in his writings. Because in his early writings, he would start them off in such a way that said, I, Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus. Basically what Paul was saying there was this, like God, you're God, and you're awesome, but I'm smart too. I'm an apostle. See, sometimes we get hung up on our titles. God's not a a title person. But see, in this moment, it's like Paul's saying, you know what, God, like, I love you, you've changed my life, but we're going to do this together because I'm an apostle. Later on in his writings, you can see him raise the bar, and then he says, I, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. He raised the bar, he took it to another level, now I'm your servant, God. The only problem is a servant still has rights. Later on, you can see in his writings, even if you read the book of Romans, he says, I, Paul, a slave of Christ. The remnant raises the bar to where we say, I, whoever your name is, a slave of Christ. Meaning I have no more rights. I don't say no, God. When you tell me to go somewhere, I go there. When you tell me to give, I give. When you tell me to serve, I serve. When you tell me to reach that person, I reach that person. We've got to raise the bar to where we say, the remnant, a slave of Christ. That's who the remnant is. We go to the places that others may not be willing to go. We take a stance on truth that others are not willing to take. Why? Because that's what God told me in His Word. And I don't have the right to tell God no. I don't have that right. I lost that right. It's not about me. It's about Him. It's just like John the Baptist when Jesus and His disciples were baptizing people. And they came up to Him and they said, Hey, John, you're John the Baptist. He's doing your job. And not only that, he's not doing it. His disciples are actually doing it. They're baptizing people. He's taking your spot. John 3.30, he says, he must increase and I must decrease. The remnant has that thought and that attitude. He must increase. I must decrease. Because it's not about me. It's not about what I want. It's not about my comfort. It's not about uh, my, my finances. It's about God's kingdom. And if he tells me to give, I give. If he tells me to go, I go. It's all about our relationship with him. But sometimes we fall into this thought process in this world that our relationship with God is somehow about me. My relationship with God has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with him. Listen, I study God's word because I see this in Christian world. We want to study God's word a lot of times so we can debate one another. I don't study God's word for that. I study God's word because this guy without this, without Jesus, is not a good person. Think about it. When you pray, how many of you have been praying and you still have some really bad thoughts at times? Because you don't control your thoughts, right? Sometimes things pop in. The devil wants to lie to us, deceive us, different things. 
I read God's word so that it can transform my life. Not so that I can cut you up with it. So that it can pierce my heart. It's a two-edged sword so I can kill the devil and pierce my own heart. Because as God's word transforms my life, and as I'm full of God's word, now I have it to offer. Now I have it to give to somebody because I've raised the bar every day. We have to raise the bar. We have to be like the Apostle Paul and say, I'm a slave of Christ. And when you're a slave to God, he's going to tell you sometimes to do some radical things. And guess what? He's going to give you dreams and visions and tell you to go somewhere and do something. And even well-meaning people will come into your life and they'll tell you you're not supposed to do that. They told Paul, don't go to Rome. He said, no, I'm going. I don't have a choice. I'm a slave. God told me I don't have a choice. People are going to come against those dreams and things that God has, God has given you. And it might be well-meaning. But the remnant says, I'm going to stop at nothing. I'm going to stop and I'm going to do everything at all costs to, to fulfill the dream God has given me. It's just funny to me how time changes situations, though. Because as time goes on and as we continue to follow God, what happens is uh, other people have tried to dictate and determine what God tells us to do. But we've got to be like Paul because Paul at times, he had to go against the majority. He, had to, he, even, he even corrected Peter at one time. He said, wait, 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 you're being, this, what, what, what? You're trying to teach people that we don't have to be circumcised and all this and now you're, you know, you're doing all this? What, what, hey, whoa. Sometimes we have to go up against the majority. And right now in society, the majority of what we're seeing anyway is not really God's word. It's grace without true repentance. It's grace without life change. It's grace as a permission slip to be a drunk. To revel and live in lawlessness and debauchery. Whereas true grace is repentance, coming back to the cross, saying, God, change my life. You know, it's, it's, it, and, and, and what happens is it gets taken out of context. God says, he, he wants us to come as we are. But once we give our life to him, he expects us to begin to change. You can't stay the same. Listen, every time I pray and hang out with God, something changes in me. I don't like it most of the time. It's not comfortable. God's like, I need you to do this. And I'm like, I don't. Do I have to? Like, you know, God, like, I'm comfortable right now. It's like, no, do it. And I'm like, okay. But what I found is when I'm obedient, when I do it, when I raise the bar in my life, that God always, hey, he takes me to another level with him. And I learn more about who he is. And I learn more about myself in the sense that I'm created in his image and I'm supposed to be a Christian, which is Christ-like. And so I become more Christ-like. No, I'm never perfect. No, I still have, I make mistakes. I have issues. I have to ask God for forgiveness too. But when I ask God for forgiveness, I really purpose in my heart I'm not going to do it again. Because I've got to raise the bar. I've got to move past that. I've got to move past that obstacle. I've got to move past that thing. Listen, raising the bar is spiritual. It's what Jesus did right after he was baptized. He disappeared and went and fasted in the wilderness. He said, I've got, I've got to raise the bar. I've received the Holy Spirit in this moment, but now I've got, to go, I've got to go hide for a minute and raise the bar so that I can go and change the world. Jesus showed us what it is. Raising the bar is radical. Raising the bar is different. Raising the bar is doing something that nobody else will do. Going somewhere that nobody else will go. Preach something that nobody else will preach. Love when nobody else will love. Serve when nobody else will serve. Speak life when there's been death spoken. See what God sees in other people. See the lostness of humanity and be broken for it. Raising the bar is spiritual. It's what Jesus was all about. But in order to raise the bar, we have to get past us. I have to get past me if I'm going to raise the bar. And I have to understand and realize that this is not about when I want to do things. It's about when God tells me to do things. Listen, God has given all of us different spiritual gifts. We don't have the right to tell our Father when we will or will not use them. We've got to be using them all the time. And here's what I even say. You've got to use them different tomorrow than you did today. Because some of us get comfortable in using our gifts and using whatever, and we just do the kind of the same, the same thing over and over. Allow God to stretch you and do something different tomorrow than you did today. 
where we get comfortable sometimes in our, in our, in our crews and our families and different things, and, and God needs to take us to another level. Why? Because the largest church in San Diego, the largest church in Albuquerque, the largest church in America is not pastored by any human being. It's pastored by the devil himself. Look at the media. Look at everything. And see, sometimes as Christians, we get upset. We see these, these, these bad artists and these different things, and they're, you know, the, the Jay-Zs and Nicki Minajs of the world, and they're, 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 they're teaching their values, and they're doing all this demonic stuff, and we want to post our opinion on social media about it. But here's my mentality, because I have a raising the bar competitive mentality. I say, I don't, I don't need to talk about it. You keep doing what you're doing. I'm going to be so full of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to take over what you're doing. You keep spitting your lies. Go ahead. I'm not worried about you spitting your lies because I know that there's an army of remnants rising up. We're going to overtake all of the devil's stuff. Listen, I don't have to be concerned with what he's doing. We get so concerned. Well, the devil's doing this. I don't care. I know what he's up to. The Bible tells me what he's doing. He's roaring like a lion. Right? He's the roaring lion because he can't really, he has no power. So he just roars really loud and tries to intimidate and scare us with diseases and different things. We got to look right back at him and say, you do your best, Satan. Go ahead. Go ahead, because the remnant's not moving. You say what you want to say. You do what you want to do. You keep lying in the media. You keep pushing your propaganda and watch what God does when he shows up. Because when times always get the worst, times always look the darkest, that's when God shows up and shows out the most. And he's looking for the remnant to rise up so that he can shine through us so that as the enemy's doing what he does, one day we rise up and we say, we're not going to take it anymore. We're tired of this. We're going to be different. We're going to raise the bar. We're going to change the world together for the cause of Christ. You're not going to shut us up. You're not going to stop us. Because I was bought with a price that's far greater than what you can do to me. I was bought with whips. I was bought with nails on a cross. I was bought with humiliation. I was bought with abuse. I was bought with beard being ripped out and spit on and mocked. I was bought with a high price. I was bought with the Blood of the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God. The Lion of the tribe of Judah gave of perfection. Left perfection to come to this earth to take my place. I don't have time to piddle with what you're doing, devil. See, we give the devil too much credit. We give him too much credit. The devil made me do it. No, he didn't. You made a bad decision. We give him credit like, oh, he's got all this control. That's cute. I look at the enemy, I'm like, that's cute. You keep trying. Yeah, you're deceiving all these people. That's cute. But I, I've read the end of the Bible. I know who has the final say. The remnant's not, see, we can't be moved by what the enemy's doing. We've just got to keep on the path that God called us because eventually as we keep on that path, even though sometimes it looks like, God, when are you going to actually show up? I don't know that answer, but I do know that he's going to. I do know that he's going to come with a sword. I do know that he's going to come and separate. And I do know this, that one day every knee is going to bow, whether they want to or not, and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. As remnant, we have to raise the bar. We can't give up when things get hard. We can't give up when we feel like, but, but Stevie, you don't understand what I've been going through. Listen to me. Some of us are going through some junk. Stuff happens. You know, I was reading about a golf ball and how golf balls uh, were invented and made. And I love the story of golf balls. I I love golf. I love playing golf. My dad didn't ever tell me he would never play with me if I beat him at golf because I do beat him at that quite a bit. So it's my revenge for basketball. Gotcha. Uh, But the original golf ball, when they made them, they were smooth. And so they were hitting the golf balls, and what they found out was after a few holes and it had been hit quite a few times, it started getting bruised and beat up and had scuff marks and different things and wasn't as smooth anymore. And what they started finding was that the not smooth golf balls went further than the smooth ones. So they went back in and redesigned it and put the little golf ball that we have now, you know, the golf ball with dimples or whatever you'd say. Because what they found is those that were bruised, 
Those that had some things, those that had faced some adversity went further than the other ones. Listen, some of you were mad at God because, God, how are you doing this to me? Why are you doing this? And instead of being mad at God, we need to look and realize that God isn't trying to hurt you. He's trying to redesign you. Because as he redesigns you and as he, you, he allows you to go through some things and you get your limp, he starts sending you further than you could ever go. Sometimes we look and say, God, I was serving you. And you're, it's like I'm going backwards. We've got to realize that his remnant and as we serve God, he's not, we're not just going backwards. He's got us on a slingshot. And when you pull a slingshot back and let it go, it goes further and it has momentum. God is trying to launch the remnant into the future. God is trying to launch the remnant into the heart of America, into a heart of of a nation into a heart of a world that said there is hope the hope of glory Jesus Christ who came and loved me so much that he gave of his only God loved me so much that he gave of his only son he loved me so much that he as he was praying he said not my will but yours be done God can we be that radical can we raise the bar to that level to where we hit our knees and maybe we're sweating blood because I've never been that nervous in a situation to where the Bible says he was sweating blood. I say, God, this might lead to death. This might lead to some crazy things, but not my will, but yours be done. We've got to raise the bar so high that we're so full of the Spirit that the devil recognizes it. See, because I believe when Paul was shipwrecked and he was making the fire, and that snake jumped up and bit him. And all the people are watching, waiting for him to die. I believe that even the demons recognize the authority of the Holy Spirit inside of the remnant. Because here's what I believe. As that snake bit him, I believe the devil recognized, oh wait, I can't touch this one. Didn't even drop poison in him and fell off. He shook him off. Because the enemy can't touch us. He can't touch those full of the Spirit of God. He tries and what he does is he just tries to intimidate us because he's all bark and no bite. You say, yeah, but bad things are happening. I know. That's because we're being redesigned. That's because God's redesigning us. Because he knows we need certain things and he knows that if we can make it through these times of adversity, that we can make it through whatever he's calling us to. We can make it to where he's calling us to go. You say, but... But when I raise the bar, there's a lot of pressure with this. Yes, but with pressure comes privilege. With times of great pressure comes great privilege. Too often we want the privilege of eternity in heaven without the pressure of living for him on this earth. There's going to be people come against you. People are going to hate you for speaking the truth, standing and being remnant. People will dislike you. People will hate you. Why? Because the enemy hates you. But see, I love to be in that position. I want the enemy to hate me. Hate me. Because you don't just hate me. You hate God. And he's way cooler and bigger than I am. He stepped on your head when he shed his blood on the cross. You thought you had him, but you didn't. Listen, if you would just bow your heads and close your eyes with me real quick in this place. I want to make sure that everybody in here knows Jesus. If you're in here and you say, Stevie, I have never actually given my life to Christ. So raising the bar begins with us first acknowledging our need for Jesus. And if you're in here, and I know we've had some salvation moments, but I, I just don't want to miss anybody. If you're in here and you say, Stevie, I've never given my life to Jesus. I've never surrendered my life to the one who gave his life for me. It doesn't matter how many times you've made mistakes, how messed up you are, how, how much you feel like you don't deserve it. Listen, I don't deserve it. That's why it's grace. That's why it's the free gift of God. Because he gave it. The Bible says while we were still sinners, Christ died. If that's you, with every head bowed and every head closed, you say, I've never given my life to Jesus. Or maybe you have before, but you've kind of walked away and you say, I want to recommit my life to Jesus. That from this moment forward, I'm going to serve him. If that's you with every head bowed and every eye closed, when I count to two, I want you to raise your hand. If that's you, when I count to two and you want to give your life to Jesus, I want you to raise your hand. One, get ready. Get ready, two. Put them up. There's anybody that says, I need to surrender. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I see all those hands. If you raise your hand, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. 
I'm going to ask that you'd repeat this prayer after me aloud so you can hear your own voice. More importantly, I'm going to ask that you'd believe it in your heart. For those of you that Jesus is already your Lord and Savior, if you'd also repeat this in support of those who raise their hand. If everybody would say, Father, I come to you now seeking salvation. So right now, I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord, that you sent him to die on the cross for my sin, and that you raised him from the dead three days after. So Jesus, I give you my life. I ask that you forgive me of my sin. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Teach me and guide me in all your ways and in all your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the Bible tells us in the book of Luke that when one sinner comes to repentance, heaven rejoices. So family, can we rejoice? There were several people that made a commitment to Jesus. Come on, we can do better than that. This is what we're here for. And the remnant lives for this moment. Jesus died for this moment. Here's what I want to do. As he just continues to play. and If you're in here and you say, you know what? Stevie, I, I need to commit my life to raising the bar. Maybe you say, I've gotten comfortable where I'm at. I've gotten comfortable in my walk. If everybody just, where you're, where you're seated, if you could stand with me, just stand where you're at. And if that's you, though, and you say, you know what? If I'm being honest, I haven't been raising the bar. And from this moment forward, I'm going to raise the bar. I'm going to pray a little bit more than I did the day before. I'm going to worship a little bit more. I'm going to read I'm going to raise the bar to the level where I begin to say I'm a slave of Christ. And if that's you and you say, you know what, I need to make that commitment. Maybe I haven't really been raising the bar or maybe I've never made that kind of commitment to God. And you say, you know what, I want tonight to be my night to commit to being remnant, to raising the bar. If that's you, I want you to get out of your seat and I want you to come up here with me. It says, I'm going to commit to raising the bar. I'm going to pray for you. I'm ready to raise the bar. As you come up here, just lift your hands and close your eyes and begin to worship Jesus. And God, you see them. You see the areas that need to be touched by you, God. You see the heart that is saying, God, I want to raise the bar. Allow us to be a people, God, that raise the bar every single day. God, fill us so full right now of your Holy Spirit. Invade us right now, God. Our hearts and our minds. Let our hearts be in tune with your word, with what you're saying in this moment, God. Speak to us, Holy Spirit. This is your people. This is remnant. Let us be people who raise the bar, God. Give them the strength and the courage to stand when everybody else is seated. Give them the strength and the courage to live for you when nobody else will. When it seems impossible, let them see that with you all things are possible. Give us a heart of courage, God. Courage to be committed to Jesus. To not back down when faced with adversity. To not quit when things don't go our way, but to come to the realization, God, that you love us so much that you allow us to experience things in life because you want us to travel as far as we can possibly go. That adversity takes place because you need us to have different things. So God, I pray that from this moment forward, abiding place, the city of San Diego, would just continue to raise the bar. There are already people, God, that raise the bar, but let them, let's, let's take it to another level. God, we love you. We worship you in this place. We thank you for being here. Holy Spirit, thank you, God. In the cross, be my joy. 
forever and my raptured soul now finds its joy with flowing in the river in the cross in the cross be my joy forever and my righteous soul now finds this glory flowing in the cross There's a fountain, a healing stream that never will run dry. And there's a place of rest I find where all my burdens I leave behind. Come on now. There's a fountain. A healing stream that never glory forever and my rapture so now finds this glory flowing in the river. I was reminded when Pastor Stevie was sharing. My little girl's a gymnast. And we bought her the, the bar. It's in our garage. And recently she came to me. In fact, I think Steve was in the garage with us. We, were, we were, came to visit. And we, were, we, had, we had done an event. And we were just kind of goofing off. And she walked up to me and she said, Daddy, I've tried to raise the bar. But it won't go any higher. You're going to have to buy me a new bar. <laughs> now, you got to understand, <laughs> gymnastics equipment is not, this, we're not talking about Walmart. you got to order that stuff. And I said, Abby, you're getting taller. She said, I need a higher bar, and you're going to have to raise it for me. Here's the reason why I say that to you. I said, you got it. So I've actually been researching, get her a new bar. And that hit me when he was sharing because I thought, she didn't run to her friends at school and say, raise the bar. She didn't go to, any, she didn't go to her coaches and say, you got to get me a new bar. She came to her father. And the father's the one that raises the bar. The father's one that has the power to say, you know what? You can do better than that. You can jump higher than that. You can stretch. And what I love and I feel in my spirit from hearing Pastor Stevie just share, man, is that God, I mean, he, he nailed me on some, I mean, I was, I was getting rocked over there because I'm sitting there going, yeah. Because I asked the Lord for these first two remnants. I said, Father, truly define what the remnant is for me. I shared some of that this morning. And there's a reason why I'm doing that, why well, I'm sharing this for just a moment, because we're about to go to a little bit more of a, maybe, maybe another level of this altar, because God's not done. Because you came walking down here and you say, okay, I'm going to raise the bar. And he gave us the whole layout of what it means to raise a bar. But there is a physical manifestation of stretching and saying, God, I will do it. There is a price to pay. There's a cost for the call. I believe that. Somebody once said on his deathbed, if the cost is not enough, the call, or if the cost is too great, the call is not enough. And God is saying, I'm looking for some people that will stretch. It is time. This youth ministry, I looked over at Pastor Daniel just a, uh, or just a moment ago, and I'm going, man, I love these students over here. And, 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 and what I saw come up tonight, I saw young people that are saying, yeah. I'll take the Nazarite vow. I'll be the one that'll just rise up. I'll be the one that'll say, no, I'm not bowing anymore. Would you lift your hands across this place? Because the Holy Spirit's about to unction you. He's about to unction you. And here's what I want you to say. I want you to say, Father, Father. here it comes. <laughs> here it comes. Get ready. Say, Father, Father. Will, you raise the bar? will you raise the 
Help me raise the bar. I can't do it on my own. I'm going to stretch. I'm going to another level. I've got to get better. Father, you bought me the bar. You've already purchased it. So tonight, I'm going higher. I'm letting go of some things. I don't have to do the stuff I used to do because he's called me to go higher. You've raised the bar because I am remnant. Now begin to pray out loud in the Holy Spirit, and God's going to begin to elevate you. Some of you is going to ask you to leave some things behind, maybe even break off some relationships, some friendships, some things that have held you back. God's saying, the bar up here, what used to work down here won't work for you anymore. He is calling you to a Nazarite anointing, an anointing that says, I walk away from the things of old. I leave the stuff behind. <coughs> I'm letting go. Come on, begin to say, God, I'll leave that stuff behind. I'm leaving that garbage behind. I don't want it anymore. Maybe, listen to me, there may be some addictions in your life, and God's saying, you felt okay down here with that, but you can't have that anymore. He's asking you for a be, to be the vessel. So lift your hands and say, Lord, clean me out. Remove my desires that are not your desires. I'm letting go. Come on, begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. Begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. God is literally going to make some of you to the point where you get sick at the thought of sin. He's going to literally say to some of you that are single, that are dating the wrong people, and you're missionary dating, and God is saying no more of that, no more missionary dating. It doesn't end up good. He's going to say to you, it's time. There's adults in this room that God is saying, turn that off in your house. Turn that off on your TV. Clean the stuff out of your house. Well, Pat, that's legalism. No, that's called boundaries, and God has got a boundary. Study his word. It says he sets the boundaries in order of all creation, and God's giving you boundaries so that when you start to cross a line, an alarm goes off. God is saying no more. Come on, cry out to him because he's consecrating us. That's what remnant is. It's a consecration that raises the bar. I raise the bar. See, you don't even realize what I'm saying to you. Some of you don't. You got to make up your mind to go farther than your dad did. Go farther than your family's gone. I made up my mind. I used to tell Karen all the time, I'm going farther. Tell my son all the time, go past me, go past me, go past me. Raise the bar. That's called generational blessings. That's called walking in an authority. Stuff that my family never prayed over when I was growing up in a Christian house, we pray over. It's it's taking it to another level. Not that I'm better than them. I'm just raising the bar. Because God is demanding all of you. God doesn't want half of you. I love what Reinhard Bunke said to me one time. He said, you know, people always say, Pat, they always say, Um, God, you know, I kind of felt God tonight as if he's a percentage. God's not a percentage. And I asked him, I said, how is it that you go places and see the dead raised? And he said, I know that God shows up 100%, so I have to. You know what God's asking from us? Not 80%. Not 90%. He wants all of you. Where you can sit in class or sit at work and pray in the spirit and not give a rip what anybody thinks. If you're me, my, my classroom every week is a plane. I can sit in that plane and just pray in the Spirit not care what anybody thinks. Because we are called to be the overcomer. We are called. Come on, begin to just cry out to him. Just begin to worship. Tell him, say, God, I'll raise the bar in my family. I'm going to raise the bar with my education. That's remnant. I'm going to be the one that studies when others are playing. I'm going to be the one that's praying when others are goofing off. I'm going to be the one that's standing when others are bowing to the world. I'm going to be the one that says, you know what? My body is a temple and not a shack. I'm saving it for marriage. I'm cutting off the sensuality of the society that says, i got to share my body to be liked or to be loved. No, no, no. God's saying, I want all of you, all of you, all of you, all of you. Raising the bar. See, raising the bar isn't just about a church service saying, I'm raising the bar. No, no. It's about a lifestyle shift. Come on Empower us, God. Come on, cry out, cry out, cry out. Empower us, God. Empower us, God. I I believe this with all my heart. 
The Bible says in the last days, God is going to give visions and dreams. Open your eyes and look at me and say this out loud. Say, God, when I shut my eyes, I'm asking you to give me a vision of who I'm called to. Now listen, I'm warning you. This is called raising the bar. When you shut your eyes, you're either going to see yourself, because he's trying to get you to get some things straightened out first. You may see your friends, or you may see the masses. When I shut my eyes and I pray this, I see my wife, my son, my daughter, my daughter-in-law, and then I see tens of millions behind them. That's what God does with me. You say, what if I don't see anything? So what? You say, God, when I shut my eyes, would you give me a glimpse of who I'm called to? And let me feel a passion and a burden for them. Shut your eyes now. And I see Jesus standing at the right hand. Do you see him? Raise the bar. And I see Jesus standing in the inner man of my life when I look into the mirror I see the glory now of the Son of God life living in me I see Jesus Christ, the love of my life, I see Jesus, Jesus living now in me, I see Jesus, Jesus Christ, the living son the only one for me we see Jesus say I see Jesus come on we see Jesus we see Yeah. 
dinner man right now All I want to see you never now will see is Jesus now and forevermore. Oh, we see Jesus living in our life, standing in our inner man. Behold him now, behold the Christ. We see Jesus. What an awesome sight to see the Christ Jesus living in me. That all that's seen from now throughout the age to come. Let every man see this day and from now on, Jesus. We see Jesus. We see Jesus. It's Christ the Lord, the King of eternity. Hey, we sing Jesus. Oh, the Lord of heaven, Jesus. It's all that I can say. I've determined only one thing to know. Now and forevermore, from this time now, forevermore, I will see only Jesus. Come on. From this time now, forevermore. From this time now, forevermore, throughout eternity, oh, I see Jesus. Oh, yeah, come on. From this time now, Forevermore, all I see, I want to say is Jesus. Jesus. Come on, from this time for, from evermore, throughout the age, all I want to see is Jesus. Everybody, give a shout to Jesus. Be exalted now. Be exalted now. Be exalted now. Jesus Christ, my King. Be exalted now. Be exalted now. Above everything in my life and everything that I could see. Be exalted now. Be exalted now, be magnified. Oh, be exalted now. Oh, be exalted now. In everything, be magnified. That's it. Be magnified. Be magnified. Look, be magnified. I see Jesus. Be magnified. Be glorified. Be glorified in me. Be magnified.
Just lift your hands towards heaven. If you have any sickness in your body, be healed right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. If you have any torment in your mind, if you have any harassment in your spirit, be healed now in Jesus' name. The power of the living God touches you from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. In Jesus' name, I tell you at this very moment in time, from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, you're painted with the blood of Jesus Christ. And Satan and the circumstance in the world around you will not be able to claim you and hold you in the things and confine you in the things that you've known and understood up to this moment in time. But in Jesus' name, you begin to move out with an authority that only belongs to those who've been filled with the spirit of boldness by the Holy Ghost. Father, we thank you that you've given to us power and the ability to bear witness of you, to testify of you, to show the world around us this glory that only belongs to you. And Father, I pray that to every person that stands here right now, it will be bigger than an occupation. It will be bigger than an identity as an athlete. Bigger than any degree that can be accomplished academically. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that these things that you've given us the opportunity to step into and reveal your glory and be part of all that you yourself are will become more important than everything else in this life from this day forward. That every person here will gladly yield themselves entirely over to you. In Jesus' name. We just we want you to sing this song with us as Joshua begins to sing. And we want you to grab a hold of it in a way maybe that you haven't before. We're going to sing a, a wonderful old song, a hymn that can never die. It's called In the Cross. And that's where our lives are to be hid. That's where our lives are to exist. That's where we began. Amen. It's the altar that brought us into this place. It's a sacrifice that has allowed us to enter into this realm of heaven. It's our whole life and identity. Amen. In Jesus. There's a fountain, a healing stream that never will run dry. There's a place of rest I find where all my burdens I leave behind. Yes, there's a fountain, a healing stream that never will run dry. And there's a place of rest I find where all my burdens I leave behind. Oh, in the cross.
There's a fountain, a healing stream that never will run dry. And there's a place of rest I find where all my burdens I leave behind. Oh, in the cross, in the cross, be my glory forever. And my rapture soon I'll find its glory flowing in the river. Yes, in joy that lasts forever if you've had pain in your body or sickness either even from a toothache to a bone ache if you'll go and check right now or just notice you're completely healed healing anointings here the rain is the rain of heaven's falling you can have whatever you desire right now. Papa's giving it out for free. Whatever you want, you can have right now. Father's giving it for free. Somebody might have told you that in the past and it didn't happen, but I'm telling you, and it's happening right now. You just reach out and you begin to just receive from Him. I don't care what it is. Maybe you have a heart condition. doesn't matter what it is. Maybe, maybe there's been problems with your ability to physically function. Maybe back injury, whatever it is right now. The Lord's healing you. Healing it right now in the name of the, the living God just received healing. I mean, even down, to the, even down to the minor things like cavities, I'm telling you. I'm telling you, toothache stuff, just a whole, this is a whole body improvement taking place right now. And further, furthermore, 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 the Lord has determined that if you're going to be a laborer in the harvest, you have to be endued with power from on high anyway. So you might as well be the first recipient of all that God wants to give you so you can go and do what he's purposed you to do. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And your raptured soul has found this joy. That's it. That's it. That's it. Right now, be strengthened. Right now, in Jesus' name, 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 be filled. Those of you all the way to the back seats, back rows back there, I'll tell you right now, we got enough anointing to extend back that far. I tell you, hey, I want you to come here. Anthony, bring your son. I want you to come here. I want you to get right here in the big middle. Hey, you think I'm going to let somebody stand and be left out? Ain't no way. I was just looking around going, who's left out? Get over here. Get over here. Everybody just kind of move in a little closer now. Come on, just fill in the spaces. Just fill in the sp Get him moving. Now move in tighter that way. Yeah, tighter that way. Just tighter. Just tighter and move in tighter. Just getting a little tighter. Got to get in tighter. Got to get in tighter with each other. Don't get in tighter with each other. Got to get in closer. Get closer in. Get close. Squeeze up. Squeeze. Squeeze up. Squeeze up. In a masate. Squeeze up. And get in tighter. Get in closer. Get in tighter. Tighter. Get in tighter. Squeeze in there. Look at that big, huge gap. Don't be afraid of each other. Get in tight. Masada Baya. Get in tight. Get in, get in tight. Squeeze together. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus. In Jesus. The unbreakable, impenetrable, 
union of those who stand together, who pray and intercede for one another, who to continually stir one another up and provoke one another to good works and Christ, reminding, remembering who you are, what you're supposed to be doing, not letting up, not giving up, not slowing up for nothing. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hey guys, let your hands right there towards heaven now. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus right now. In Jesus' name. Pitaktu sopra bate vretega. I vreveta fede. I want everybody to put your hand on the person that's in front of you all the way up here. All the way up here. All the way up here. Just put your hand on the person in front of you. They don't have to be on their head, just on their shoulder, whatever. Now, you know what? A lot of people do not understand the educational system that's going down in Southern California about that the whole nation, unless God intervenes, is going to find out about. They don't know the pressure. They don't know the, the homosexual agenda that has already been placed in our schools, the perversion, the demand that our government has given to us that we must call good evil and evil good. And I'm telling you right now, if there's anything that needs to go down right now, is we've got to see every person that's standing here tonight, that's in the elementary schools, that is in the junior high school and the high school, so strengthened and emboldened with the power of God, because it is an evil day and it is almost seemingly impossible to stand. But right now, in Jesus' name, right now, in Jesus' name, Father, we thank you that you stand for us. We thank you that you've gathered around us, that you keep us by your mighty power. You keep us, oh God, by your mighty hand of grace and authority. Yeah, get up in here. Get on up in here. Sari, get up here. Get up here. Come on now, come on now. Begin to intercede for the school. Begin to intercede right now for the campus. Begin to intercede for the pressures that people are under right now in the school system that is bigger than even a, a full-grown man in God can stand. Father, we cry out for change. 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 Father, you've got to move by your spirit with your authority to break off this yoke. Father, we pray and thank you for protection upon the, your people. Get in close. Get in close. Squeeze in tight. Squeeze in tight. Get in close. Jesus. Father, I thank you right now in Jesus' name for strengthening Pat for this work that he's got to do. Father, I thank you for strengthening him. I want you to pray with me right now. We're going to pray for Pat. Father, we thank you for strengthening him right now for the work that he has to do. Just reach out this way over here, everybody. Father, we thank you for strengthening Pat for the work that he's got to do. Right now, in Jesus' name. You lay hands on me, I lay hands on Pat. Just right, right here. Just go ahead. Right now, in Jesus' Strengthening the baby. Found Pat to stand with them for this work, oh God. You know, Father, the urgency, and it is great. It's a great work. 
Father, only you can do this. Man cannot do it. Only you can do this, Father. And we hear this cry of the Spirit, the cry of Pat's heart. We know, Lord, that you birthed this vision, that it is not of man. It is of you. It is of you, Father. It is of you. You did it. It's yours. And, Father, we thank you, God, that none of us need steady that which you do. But stand and watch your glory. Make a, make a, make a work of it, oh, God. Make, a, make a, a job of it complete and full. Thank you, Father. 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 Thank you, Let me say this. Let me say this, uh, Pastor Steve and, and Pat, because maybe you don't know this. I'm not interested in really talking about what Satan is doing, but you need to understand the opposition that, that this nation is up against and why we believe this is so very, very important. This past year, the uh, legislation of California passed that even books will be put in our schools, in elementary school, that would show three lifestyles, the homosexual, man with man, woman with woman, and then the hetero lifestyle, heterosexual lifestyle, and that our children must select that all three of these are equal, and they cannot be biased or prejudiced against them. We have now, uh, we, we have now already have passed laws of unisex bathrooms in our, down to our elementary schools. I'm telling you, it is an agenda of wickedness on a scale that nobody can believe. People don't even believe that what I'm saying is true. I'm not exaggerating. I'm telling you, this is what's gone down. It's gone down over the past uh, year. And, and we know that the uh, agenda is to sweep this, this, this anti-God, anti-Christ, immoral agenda to sweep this nation. And, it, and, and unfortunately, it is just as though we're a small minority that is able to have this influence in the hands of, of Satan. And I'm with you, Steve. What you were saying tonight, forget about it. I mean, bring it on. Father says there's a contest. They might have, they might have, look, they might have 300 million with them. And if there's one with us. Because there's more, even, you know, the thing about it is there's more. There's, and I'm the one I'm talking about is Jesus, but, you know, the Holy Ghost right now. But the reality of it is, is if there's ever been a time of peril that our eyes have got to be open, that we can see there's more on our, with us than are with them. And that there is a realm of the unseen of greater authority, and we got to stop this stuff. And we, and, and we have to recognize that if we, if we give in to sin, if we commit treason against the kingdom of God, we capitulate in the realm of our power and authority. God still loves us. His mercy and His grace is still there. He's still going to nurture us and help us, and we're going to be beloved to Him. But when, when we become under entangled with that, uh, we become servants of it, and we've lost our ability to stop what Satan's doing. And, and the hinderer of iniquity, the hinderer of anomia or lawlessness is the church. And we have got to find our place, our foundation. If we lose our place to stand, if the foundation is destroyed, then where can the righteous stand? And this, this is God. We have got to do whatever it takes to see this foundation, which no man can lay, but that which is laid, Christ Jesus. No other man can lay it, that which is laid, Christ Jesus. We've got to be willing and we've got to get passionate about this. We've got to understand that we are in a battle. That's why Paul said, be strong in the strength of the Lord and the power of his might. Because it's that level. If we can just conceptualize it, when we finally get it, when we recognize what we are really involved in, suddenly we're going to get desperate for the only, the only provision and ability that can possibly stand in the day. And then we're going to have that opportunity to function and this authority that God has given to be strong in the strength of the Lord and the power of His might. I know what the pressures are. I'm going to tell you right now, kids, young people, listen to me. What you have to go through tomorrow, 
most mighty men in God would not even know how to stand in. We are living in such a promiscuous environment. You guys don't even know. People don't even know what goes on in Southern California. They try to guess the pressure that is on anybody to walk godly is intense. Satan thinks he owns us. But I'm going to tell you, Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth. And he's just looking for us to agree with him. So Pat, I'm going to say, man, I so believe in what you're doing. I'm so believing it. I hear, I hear this cry from heaven. There has got to be a, uh, there has got to be a place for the righteous to stand. There's got to be a difference made. People have got to understand what Father has purposed for us to do and to be if we're ever going to be effective in the earth as his church. So we bless you. We thank you. I'm just so blessed, Pastor Steve and Steve Jr. You guys are just standing with Pat in this. I mean, I praise God for what God's done with you in Albuquerque. That is amazing that you can stand in righteousness and purity and holiness and still grow a big church. I believe that's the day that we're living, that we're living in. That, that really reality of it is you can have signs, wonders, and miracles and it's going to be the masses rather than to have everybody exiting out the back door as it goes on. Satan fights us so hard in this city that if there's any manifestation of the Spirit, suddenly we're coined to be something demonic. You know, that, that fight's coming to an end. Father's going to get us both. Father's coming in. So. The, Lord, the Lord's, I asked, Lord, why do you want us to go to San Diego? Because I called him and I said, I really feel like we're supposed to do this in San Diego. And this morning when I was praying, he said, the spirit that is attacking San Diego and his, and literally there's a bubble over this property. I believe that I, I see a spiritual bubble. In fact, when we were worshiping, I saw angels and uh, angelic beings. But the Lord said, I let you feel what's here because it's sweeping like a flood across America. But I will say this. Because we're, we're really good. You know, prophetic voices are really good at doom and gloom. You have built my faith this weekend. Oh, you have no idea. Built my faith. Look, built my faith. Because we're going to do this. You're doing it with us. So uh, it, this, this has built our faith. This time, let the remnant rise. Hey, folks, grab each other, hug each other. I mean, especially hug folks like, huh? I want, you, I, I want you guys to come over here and hug Vincent. The people that are feeling discouraged especially, hug them. Tell them, we're going to do this thing, man. We're standing with you. You're not going to get drugged into some nonsense by the powers of darkness. You guys have a protective love over one another. Protective love. A watchful, protective love. <laughs>